Do you have some pattern paper you want to use, but you prefer to make five by seven cards? Hi, I'm Jess from JessCrafts.com, and I'm here to help you make the most of your crafty supplies and time. So let's get making. Today I have a paper busting template for six by six paper, but it makes two five by seven cards. So we're going to start by following the directions for how to cut. I have picked some photo play paper, say it was stamps, pattern paper. I picked it. It's just very simple dot paper. And it's because the way that this sketch works, this piece here is going to be turned on its side. So you need some non-directional pattern paper and polka dots are always an easy one for that. I'll cut it down to six by six. You got to always cut out that little bit there at the top. If you have it, you can always save it for the inside of the card. It does seem like we're going to be a little less than six inches when we cut that off. So something to be aware of. But yeah, you can just slip that inside the card and you're finished. We're going to come to six by four inches. I'm going to go just a tiny bit under since I know I don't have exactly six inches to work with. And then I have my four by six inch piece. I'm going to cut it into two by four inch strips. It looks like in this direction, I have exactly that six inches. So we'll make our measurements really accurate. That's the thing with all pattern paper cardstock out there. It is rarely exactly the size that it says it is. So I don't I try not to get hung up about that kind of stuff and just do my best. Handmade cards are supposed to look handmade. Okay, so I cut all four of the two by four inch strips that I need. Now I need to cut half inch strips off of this two inch piece. And I probably should have cut off those half inch strips first. That would be way easier than trying to cut little half inches off of this smaller bit. But you know, sometimes I don't pay close enough attention. And then I can't get a half inch with here with this paper trimmer. So what I can do is take a sticky note and use that to measure to um, kind of like extend it out. And I can take a half inch piece and stick it on there. It's kind of a complicated way of getting about this. And I could definitely see why people would prefer a trimmer that you doesn't need to do all this fussing to get there, but you can totally have a separate trimmer. I would usually just cut this with scissors. And for other reasons, this trimmer is a real workhorse. And if I had thought ahead, I would have avoided this whole situation by trimming off the half inch pieces first. Okay. So this is gonna make two cards. I can put one set to the side and then I'm going to need mats that are a quarter inch bigger. I was able to pick a cardstock that had a lot of scraps and since I need some relatively small pieces, I was able to use those up to create these. So my two by four inch piece gets a two and a quarter by four and a quarter inch piece of cardstock and my two by half an inch gets two and a quarter by three quarters of an inch in uh, a mat. So next we're going to assemble everything according to the sketch and I'm sure something that most people who create five by seven cards will agree with me is that what one of the really nice things about them is they give you a lot more room to work with so you can have you know use more of your paper you can use a larger design and that's what I'm going to do today. Spellbinders has a house mouse release so they now have um, the publishing rights to that. These are like these really beautiful classic stamps and they've been available from different companies over the years from the illustrator and they have these new well I don't mean I don't know if they're like new designs but like they're newly available and you probably have some um if you like house mouse you maybe have some vintage ones in your collection the big old rubber stamps but now they're rubber cling and they do have the I mean rubber stamps stamp this kind of detail beautifully so as you can see, there's all those little dots and all that kind of stuff. I mean, I use mostly clear stamps, but I do appreciate how rubber stamps have an ability to capture detail like that. And I, I placed out all of my cardstock pieces first so that I can kind of get and make sure everything's really even. I did consider because I don't think my sentiment is necessarily going to fit in the pattern paper. I thought about maybe moving everything to the top and leaving room for the sentiment at the bottom, but I think even still there is room and I'm not 100% sure what 100 sure what I want to do. This was double-sided paper, so I'm going to use the bigger dots 
as well, just to kind of mix it up. I am using them in the smaller strip, but the Baker Dots aren't so big that they look silly in those small strips. And then I will prepare my stamp. And I think until I have my stamp prepared, I'm not sure how I'll want to finish off the card. I'm going to focus just a little bit on how I would approach coloring the house mouse itself, because I think that would be the most helpful thing as most people will, you know, you can gather many, many mice from the collection or from other collections and you'd want to focus on, well, okay, well, how would I approach the mice? Because that's the same throughout. So I like to put a little bit of a pink undertone on the skin and then also here on the belly because that is where the fur appears to be thinnest. So that should be sticking out. But then I like to add in some warm grays. You can approach a gray animal with really any of the grays. I kind of tend to the warm grays, especially for mammals, because I want them to have like that warmth to their skin that's created by being a warm blooded creature. So, you know, snakes don't really need that. It's okay for them to look cool. They don't have that, that blood pumping through or the warm blood, obviously blood, you know what I mean? Um, so what is something else you can think about with when coloring an image like this, is the artist has drawn in some detail lines for you. And so that's actually where your color should be darkest. So if I'm coming in here with my W1, and that's, I'm gonna use W1 and W00 to add some color to these pinks, because I don't like to leave them pure pink. I like to add a little bit of depth, and I like to just kind of knock down that pink a little bit. So I'm gonna focus my darkest color right along that stripe, and then let everything else be lighter in that tail area, for instance. And then I'm gonna think about things like drop shadows, just because I like to add interest, but I, I don't like to be like hyper-realistic in my Copic coloring. I also think an image like this, while it might appear detailed at first, all these little artist-drawn dots and all this texture of the fur is going to hide your blending. So you do not have to be an amazing Copic blender. If you're still working on your blending and you just want some practice images, in some ways things like this can be great. I'm gonna add some darkness around the face um, and then also in areas where like there are maybe some joints. So like here's his arm where it connects things. And this is going to, by putting the darker color in certain spots, it is going to add a little bit of attention to that area, which is why I'm putting it around his face, for instance, not necessarily because it's hyper-realistic, and um, also to highlight where, you know, there is some uh, changes in his body. So like to highlight his arm by putting some darker color around it. You can also just kind of choose a side of the animal to be in shadow. So if I want to say, oh, his belly is going to be the brightest spot, then I will make things behind it darker. I can add a little bit of darkness behind the stem, for instance, if I want. And then I can come, and I, I like to use that darker color to just kind of map things out. And then I'll come in with my lighter colors and slowly blend you know, the different areas. Again, I'm just kind of like tapping the marker. I'm not doing anything amazing blending techniques here because I kind of just don't have to with this image. All of the little artist drawn lines are gonna hide that. Now, if you are gonna like go in and stamp this in more of like a no show color or something, that might be a bit different. But for me, I'm gonna let the stamp do a lot of the work for me. And I am going to come in sometimes with my marker and add to those areas where the hair is coming off of him or her, I'm not actually sure. I'm going to come in with my marker and do some similar kind of thin flicks just to make sure that that area does have some color to it because it should. It should not be white behind it. There should be a little bit of whatever color your critter is. Not much, just a few flicks. Okay, and then I'll keep going till I have the whole body blended out. I am going to make this a pink daisy to bring out the pink that I had in the matte color. And so I'll have a yellow center and a green stem. So I have my house mouse all colored. That big bright daisy flower that, you know, kind of does distract from the mouse in some ways. But he's pretty large, so I think that it's okay. And... The, I just wanted to show you the scale of it 
on an A2 size card. So it would be, to get the whole image on the card, you have to tilt it up quite a bit. So if you kind of wanted to make it look more like he was blowing in the wind, you'd probably want to put your card that direction, but there wouldn't be much left on the card, and that's totally okay. You know, you could just color this right onto the card base, add a sentiment there, maybe like a little um, shadow around him or something. Like I could see like a little ink blending or something behind him and just being done. But that is why I went for that five by seven card. This was sent to me by Spellbinders in exchange for design work. So if I hadn't mentioned that earlier, I'm going to put a little bit of my cardstock scraps behind him to kind of prop him up a little bit, kind of like foam tape. And then I need to add a sentiment. I'm fairly confident because it's a rubber stamp that it will stamp nicely, but I am going to put it in my Misty just because I can make sure it's straight and in case I make a mistake. At this point, my card's pretty assembled. I haven't actually put the mouse on yet, but um, I wouldn't want to, I wouldn't, I, like, I don't have extra pattern paper. So if I mess up, I will, um, I could just cover it. Like I could just take a banner die and put it over that. That would be an easy way to to fix it. But you know, I have a Misty. I took the extra mat out. I'm going to stamp it in green and in case I don't like it in green. That's the other reason I'll be able to use a banner and uh, it's not perfectly centered, but I think we're gonna make the, we're just gonna say that's okay. Things don't have to be perfect. I think this dark green is enough that you can read it, but I like to kind of keep pulling in the colors that I've picked. So adding a color that I have used otherwise as my sentiment instead of always stamping in black. If you found this video helpful, here's another video where you can find more ideas for enjoying your crafty time and supplies. Let me know you like this video with a share to your crafty community. Subscribe and click the bell so you don't miss the next template or tutorial. And check the video description for product links. See you in the next video.